Praise the Lord, everybody. How's it going today? I brought my computer, my laptop along because Joe says that I speak too fast. So I wrote a few notes down. I probably won't use them. But it was just so I could slow down, right? Take a few notes. Got to type in my password. Exactly the same thing. So are you guys glad you came to church this morning? Now, did anybody go out of here last week and, and go listen to the song, I Ain't Missing You at All? Did anybody listen to that song? They were playing the song by the time the service was over, and that surprised me. That was great. Tells me what kind of church you are, right? You guys are have true freedom and liberty to be able to do things that a lot of churches wouldn't do. Last week we were talking about, really, I, I guess we, we entitled it, you know, Don't Go Back. And we were looking at the book of Hebrews. Wave your hand at me if you remember. And we were talking about a number of things. I'm like a kid in a candy shop, I guess, as a preacher, so you have to forgive me, but I get excited. You know, I don't see you guys except every couple of years, and so I want to share with you everything I know. And I thought I'd grow out of that, and Bobby hoped I would, but I never did. So, <laughs> so that's really a good thing because, you know, honestly, I'm a nobody, but I know a lot. And I know a lot only because, like, I know the Lord. You know what I mean? So it would be terrible to have a preacher coming around and say, you know, I don't really know that much. I haven't really gotten that much over the past couple of years. But I get excited because, you know, when you walk with God, it's an exciting thing. Amen? And when you walk with God, He does all kinds of amazing things. You know, like, He should have done a lot more in my life. He, he probably wanted to do a lot more in my life up to this point. And I've had something to do with maybe, you know, being distracted by other things. But I tell you, the sky's the limit with the Lord. If you just crack the Bible, get in, you know what I mean? He'll show you just amazing stuff. So I wanted to give a little commercial today, not because I want you to, you know, like think I'm a big deal or give me more in the offering or anything like that. You know, really, I don't really care about those things, to be honest with you. Thank you for giving, though. Um, the kingdom's really an upside-down kingdom. If you're always trying to be first, you're going to end up last. If you're, if you're okay being last, you're going to end up first. So it's okay if we just, you know, be ourselves, amen? When we come to church like right now, you know, it's the best thing that you could possibly do in church is just get comfortable and be yourself before the Lord. And so I wanted to give you a little commercial, like go to my website, rockybeach.org. Not the greatest website in the world, but you'll find some cool things there that will help you grow. And today we're living in, like Neil said, like one of the most exciting times, the most exciting time in my lifespan. This is the most exciting time. Never seen a day like today. Everything in the world is changing. Some things are scary, but it's exciting anyway because, you know, God has called us for such a time as this. Am I doing okay? Am I slower today? <laughs> Man, we're here because we're supposed to be here. So I want you to go to the website and go to the podcast section. You find a lot of things on there, articles and, and uh, videos and different things, but go to the podcast section. And I've been spending a lot of time recently in the last, I don't know, maybe six or eight months, a lot of time just spending time going through different, different principles, Bible concepts. One of them is I made a case for miraculous faith. That's what I called it, the case for miraculous faith. And so you can find that. That's several lessons, maybe 10 or 12 lessons there in the podcast. And what that's all about is, you know, the 10 times in the Gospels that Jesus responded to someone's faith. Isn't it amazing? Only 10 times? Only 10 times. The book of Hebrews is a book about crossing over, remember? It's a book about the fact that God has always called His people to cross over. Never stay still. Don't ever go back. Keep moving forward. But you can only keep moving forward if you're walking with Him. Chapter 6 in the book of Hebrews says, listen, get your firm foundation under you. Make sure that you know what's being said in the Old Testament so you can really walk in the New Testament. A lot of people like, you know, are confused about how are we supposed to walk? Are we supposed to live in the New Testament like they lived in the Old Testament? Or are we supposed to totally just live by grace in the New Testament? But, you know, the timeline of God, I think I said this last week, is a long, continuous timeline. It goes all the way back to eternity past and it stretches all the way into eternity future. 
God's got one plan, and He's been working it for a long time. And, and you know, it's okay for us to see the big picture. So one of, the, one of the parts of the big picture that you can look at is like, go in and find out how people got God's attention in the Bible. There are only 10 of these guys. Most of the rest of the stuff Jesus did, He did it by anointing. He did it because He was called, God sent Him, and He just would come across people, and God would tell Him, do this, God would show Him, do that, and He would do that. But in these 10 cases, it was because somebody crossed Jesus' path. And I love that because here in the book of Hebrews, one whole chapter is dedicated to walking by faith. If you want to go forward in God, we have to learn to walk by faith. Now, most of us in this room today, we've been raised kind of in that whole faith teaching, haven't we? And we've heard a a lot of sermons on faith. And so there's probably way more in you than you know about faith. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're walking by faith. And so I just went into these 10 cases and I looked at, well, what did these people do, Pastor Neil? What did they do? You know, like blind Bartimaeus, he's just sitting over on the roadside and Jesus walks by. You know, if Jesus walked by today, would you say something? Or would you just be frozen in that awkward, you know, church atmosphere that we create around ourselves? I don't know if I should say or should I be quiet or, or, you know, blind Bartimaeus broke every one of those rules. Jesus was over there somewhere. The guy's blind. He doesn't even know exactly where Jesus is. And as soon as he becomes familiar with Jesus is there, he just starts crying out. And that's a case that he made for miraculous faith. If we want God to move miraculously again and do the things that we know that he wants to do, we've got to become like these 10 guys. So go to to my website and just immerse yourself in this kind of teaching. These aren't the greatest sermons. They're all about an hour apiece. But you know, give yourself the opportunity to get back in the water. This is what Christians don't do. We assume we're growing because we went to church. But if we're not actually growing, we're not seeing the things, and you know, over a period of time, then what happens is we get tired and we go backward. We start telling ourselves, well, you know, nothing's really happening. You know, just because nothing's happening in my life doesn't mean nothing's happening in the Spirit. I mean, how crazy and prideful is it to think that God just, you know, suddenly stopped doing things because I'm not perceiving what He's doing. So we just may have a commercial today. That may be the only sermon. You know, but I tell you what, as I got into these 10 cases, you know what happens? God just starts opening, He just starts opening you up and showing you, look at what this guy did. Look at what this lady did, the Canaanite woman, you know. I mean, she had no reason to believe Jesus would do anything for her. Jesus told her himself, really, I'm not sent to you. I'm not actually, my ministry is not for you. What would you do if Jesus said that to you? You'd be like, okay, sorry, Jesus, I'm sorry. Shuffle on out, you know, into our Christian culture that we become so familiar with. It's like a ball and chain around our leg, walking around, thinking that we're somebody. We don't realize we've been programmed into We don't even read the Bible anymore. Hello? Don't look at me like that. That's all of us. I'm not just preaching to you. It's the stats say none of us really are really reading the Bible anymore. We're just saying we're Christians. And then you wonder, like, how in the world did the Illuminati take over the world? And half the Christians still don't even believe in the Illuminati. They come along and said, we're the light bearers. We're the ones with the lights. We're the ones that are going to do something good for you. And half the Christians follow after all that stuff. I'm here to tell you this morning, Jesus is the light. He's the way, the truth, and the life, man. I mean, he makes those guys look sad. People ruling the world. What a sad bunch of elite one percenters. So sad. They need Jesus. The only way they're going to get saved is we rise up and know Him to the point that we actually walk with Him and we start to examine and ask questions. I mean, Dave was talking about the stone rolling away and how God's showing him. See, I was just crying. I wasn't sure what God was doing. But the Holy Spirit was doing something. But, you know, that's a beautiful picture, Dave, rolling the stone away. I mean, imagine how many stones Jesus would have rolled away. Would have been a lot more than ten. Right? Right? Imagine if people had just kind of gotten the 
the idea that blind Bartimaeus got and said, you know, G wait, wait a minute, Jesus is here? Hey, Jesus! I think we talked about this a couple years ago when I was here. I love saying, I love screaming at Jesus. It does something for me. It shakes up the cobwebs in me. Right? That's really how praise and worship should be. It really shouldn't be, you know, like, I get tired of, and I love the singers, nothing, per J Jody, this isn't about your, your group at all. I'm just saying, church music in general. It's like, I can't always sing with that because I can't sing. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm kind of going like, you guys are beautiful singers, but I'm trying to keep up with you. I'm like, ah, la, la, la. But you know, there should be something in all of us that we're told we don't really need to be able to sing. Let Jody do the singing. Let these other guys do the singing. That's what they're gifted to do. But I should just be able to just be like, yeah. God always does something with me with music, you know, when I come to Australia. That's why this happened to me this last time. You know, I ain't missing you at all. I thought I was missing Bobby. Remember, I told you the story. I was singing this old 1984 number one hit song, you know, English guy, John Waite. But I remember growing up as a kid in, in America, and man, that was a big deal. And like, Tina Turner had a big song. You know, I was already saved, but because I was working, you know, I was a kind of a construction guy going to Bible school. I was hearing all this music, and and I remember that song, and I come down here, and I'm singing. I'm like, God, what's going on? And, and you know, if you don't take time to ask God, you're not going to know. You'll just be like, well, forgive me, Lord, for singing secular songs. <laughs> so I was singing that song last week, so, we're, you know, I just want to kind of continue that thought with you today, you know, like, to, every time I come to Australia, something happens. I remember I was up in Cairns, and I was waiting for the bus out to the reef, and, and I'm talking to this guy next to me, and I said, hey, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I used to be a guitar player for the Steve Miller Band. So stuff like that happened. So I said, I said what? Now, some of us are old enough to remember the Steve Miller Band. That was, I said, are you serious? He goes, yeah, yeah, I wrote Jungle Love. And I, yeah, we struck up a conversation, became friends on Facebook, you know what I mean? He got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I get to see all that just because, you know, God does stuff with me. Bobby said last week I was talking too much about movies. But sometimes you're watching a movie, you know what I mean? And God will talk to you. I was watching that movie about Queen Victoria. And I just noticed that she really didn't like all the pomp and circumstance around her. She wanted to escape from it. And I thought, yeah, that's just so much like us. You know, we, we don't really want to do all the stuff we do. We just want God, right? But we're, we're unsure how to get back a hold of him. So we've got to get into the word. We've got to spend some time with him. We've got to, you know, be like the blind Bartimaeus and the Canaanite women. They just said, God, you know, Jesus said, I'm not called for you. And she says, well, okay, all right, let's come at this a different way, Jesus. Let's, 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 let's ask it differently, you know. Even the crumbs fall from the master's table and the dogs lick them up. I mean, can I get something from you like that, Jesus? What did Jesus say to many of these people? He says, he stops right there. You know, he's like, you guys see this person? This is great faith. This is the greatest kind of faith. He said to one guy, this is the greatest faith I've seen in all of Israel. He said that to a Roman centurion, right? That's the greatest faith. He said to this Canaanite woman, this is great faith woman. In other words, it doesn't matter what I'm called to do, what I'm anointed to do. It doesn't matter what God showed me to do. If you interrupt me on the way to doing it, God will do something for you. We need to interrupt God today. So when this song came to me, you know, I, I started to ask God, what's the deal when, when, when we started crying? And he just quickly started to show me it's because my people don't realize how much they're missing me. So this week I went back and I said, let's look at this song. Let's look at the, what's the background of the song? So this guy, John Waite, he's trying to make it in the music business. His first album is a, is a failure. So he's married. He's from London. They make him go over to New York. He has to cut another album. And he's working on this song. And as he's, you know, like practicing and everything, all of a sudden the, the kind of the refrain, the chorus comes out of his mouth. And he's just like, that's a number one hit right there. But in reading about it, it's because he was far away from his wife and he was, you know, he was not faithful to his wife. He was around other women in New York and he was torn. Are you here today? You're looking at me like, what's this got to do with Jesus? It's got a lot to do with Jesus. 
Because we're a very adulterous spiritual generation. And we're not sure. We're just like this guy. We're torn, really. You know, it's like, I love my wife, but she's in London. And I'm in New York. And there's lots of opportunities around. And that's what he was fighting. He was fighting the thought of, should I be faithful to my wife? Or should I just go be a rock and roll star? And in that, kind of the disconsolation of, he, he's trying to sort through his feelings, sort through his heart, and he comes up with that refrain, I ain't missing you at all, but he really is missing his wife. You know, and later as you read the guy's story, right, so sad, these, these Hollywood, true Hollywood stories all end the same way. I was gifted, it took me somewhere, it brought me before great men, and man, I wish I didn't do most of that. That's the short version of all of them. Wish I didn't do most. Wish I didn't expose my kids to all of that. I didn't know what was on the seedy underbelly of all that. I remember, I remember listening to one actress recently, you know, around this whole election time. You know, a lot, of the, a lot of the corruption came to the surface, didn't it? I remember hearing this one actress saying, don't you ever let your kids anywhere near a theater. Not a, not a movie theater, but a, a, a performing arts theater. It's a Hollywood actress saying this. Don't let your kids ever around acting without close supervision. Because of the people that are around acting, it's not, it's not a slam on them. I'm just telling you what she said. I didn't say it. But she said, there's so much corruption there and there's so many people wanting to get their hands on your kids. Don't ever let them go there. But you know, Christians just walk around like, oh, you know, did that happen? I don't remember. And then, they, and then they buy into the Christian culture, you know, and it's not this culture we're talking about. I, I'm describing to you a different culture. and the, the Bible culture is a different culture. This is spiritual culture. You get into this, and it starts to get in you. You look into this, and it starts to reflect back to you like a mirror, it, the new you, the real you. You know, we're saying, you know, I used to have all these fears, but now I'm a child. Of God. You're actually a lot of things now. Hello? This is the world we live in today. It's like, it's exciting, everything's changing, but it's a day to be very, very serious about the things of God. Okay to be serious today? I think, you know, I'd be doing you a disservice if I told you something different. This is a day to be serious. And by being serious, I'm not saying stuffy. I'm saying be yourself, but get real, man. Get real with yourself and get real with God. Did you know Paul told Timothy the same thing? He said, take heed to yourself. Take heed to the word of God, the things of God, all the things God said over you, the prophecies in your life. He said a lot of things to him, and then he said, and take heed to yourself. Make sure you're not just pretending or acting. The world we're living in today is changing very quickly, and reality is much bigger than you and I know. The, the way you deal with it is you run back into the Lord. You run back into his reality. So if you go to my website, you know, go to the case for miraculous faith and start to believe and build a case around your life for God to do miraculous things. What you'll find is the more you immerse in it, the more you'll find yourself just doing those things, right? The more you'll find yourself just getting excited about a different kind of things. If you go there, you'll find another set of podcasts called The Good News and just go going through the gospel again and explaining and looking at and talking about, okay, what does the gospel mean? Because I'm finding today that people are wide open to the gospel. I get these little cards. I'm not doing okay, Pastor Neil. Made up these cards. Just says Jesus on them. But I, the Lord gave me this little thing. It says Jesus, but the, the U.S. at the end says us. It gives me an opportunity to tell people what Jesus did for them. Jesus did it not only even just for you. Jesus did it for me and you. What Jesus did is so amazing that it includes me and you. We become a part of him through the whole process. That's the amazing truth of the gospel. And that's why when Paul and Peter and these guys went into the Roman world of their day, people ate this stuff up. You imagine how dark and pagan that society was, but they came along and said, hey, I want to tell you about Jesus. And by the time they were finished, they were like, I want that. Today, Christians think, well, I don't know if I want to talk about Jesus because I might get embarrassed. Or they might reject me. I think like that. I, I have those thoughts. That's why I made up the card so I couldn't get out of it. I go, God, I'm making up these cards. 
And so now I've been giving them out around here. You know, I gave it out to one, one girl the other day at a, at a gas station. I was getting fuel, petrol. And, <laughs> and the lady behind the counter, you know, I just, uh, these, these cards are great because I can just say, hey, uh, uh, do you know this guy? And it takes all the responsibility off of me having to say it right. You know what I mean? I just eliminate me out of the pro process. I'm just like, I'm just the giver. And most of the time, I, I've been doing this for a couple of years, most of the time I get nothing but just big smiles, positive responses. This girl said to me the other day, she says, I hope he's a good guy. <laughs> I can tell she's been through a few bad guys. I said, I said, I didn't say sweetheart, but she said, sweetheart, you could trust this guy. This is the guy you can trust right here. You call out to him and he will answer you, right? You reach out to him and he will solve all the problems. He, he, will, he will touch your heart and take away all the hurts. And then finally on the podcast, there's this series here, and I'm not going to keep you long talking about it today, but just make a few points. There's this series on, on Hebrews called Crossing Over. And I can't even touch it, you know, in a couple of weeks here, but, but it's something that the Lord began to do in me a couple of years ago, around about the same time as the cards. He began to talk to me about get in the book of Hebrews, just immerse yourself in it. And I was, I was taking a drive from Connecticut, where I live, across the country to Missouri, where I'm from. And my daughters were all growing up and getting married and going off to school. And so, you know, my life for a few years consisted of truckloads of their stuff going to different places. But it's a good break, you know, it's a good time. It's about a 24-hour drive. So I, I was on one of these journeys, you know, I'm pulling a trailer for somebody. And I'm going through Missouri on my way to Oklahoma. And, you know, I just spent this time immersing myself in the book of Hebrews. Somebody say immersion. You know what I mean by that? I just play an over and over and over. And sometimes I wasn't even listening. But, you know, I was listening subconsciously. But sometimes I'd be like, oh, wait, wait a minute. I'm in chapter 9. i gotta, I got to, you know, reverse it back to chapter 1. I didn't hear any of that consciously. But I would do it over and over. And I don't know. I don't even know how many times. But in, in, in a space of about a year, year and a half, I mean, man, I had just gone over and over this book. And this book started to get inside me, and the Lord started to show me stuff. And he started to say, Rocky, this book is important for this time. This way, this way he put a spark. See, when he puts a spark into you, I mean, go find out what it means. It may take you a year, two years. You know, I come from, like, the most foolish spiritual country in the world. It's, it's, you guys all know it's true. We, we have had so much of the good and so much of the God that we no longer know what to do with what we have. I was talking to one brother out here today, and we were talking about how, you know, if church seems like it's been a roller coaster ride for the past 10 years or so, it's not because necessarily you change, it's because the church has been changing. Because the culture's changing, the church is being forced to change. The demographics, people aren't the same as they used to be 10 and 20 years ago. They don't want the same things that they wanted then. They do that when they do the polls and everything, you find out all the younger guys, the millennials and the and the generation Zs and even some of the of the younger, you know, Generation Xs. I mean, they, they've got a totally different mindset about, you know, religion and spirituality. And really, the most of them have taken to new age things. And that boggles my mind because you don't really see it as you're living. You don't see a lot of things as you're just living your life. They used to teach us in all these leadership conferences that we would have, you know, that, you know, uh, perception is reality. Remember that one? Do you remember that one? <laughs> And they would teach, you know, perception is reality. So make sure that you're perceiving the right things. But it was kind of taught from the business sense of things instead of the spiritual side of things. And at the end of the day, you know, we got good at doing a lot of worldly things and we lost our children. What a bad trade-off. They come to the right church this morning. And now we're looking back, you know, we're all trying to figure out how to go forward. But what happened is the church rug has been being pulled out from under me and you. So just come to terms with what's going on around you, and then you can do something about it. What we have a tendency to do is not look at reality and then ask God to do something about it. And he's like, wake up, and I'll help you. Hello. 
So God put the book of Hebrews in me for this reason. That's what I started to see. He says, listen, the word Hebrews means to cross over. We looked at that last week. And it takes us back to Genesis 11, and it makes that dichotomy, that contrast between what the world was doing. It was developing the Babylonian mystery religion that dominates the world today. That's globalism. The, the, the religion behind it is just what the book of Revelation says, man. It's mystery Babylon. It's a lot of Christians even riding the beast. Are you here? That's Nimrod. That's what happened. Nimrod and the world decided after the flood, we're, we're going to do it our own way no matter what God does. But God said, I'm going to do it a different way. He called out a guy, Abraham. And the Bible begins to call him Abraham the Hebrew. Abraham the guy that crosses over. God's giving us a message. He said, my way of doing it is not the world way. It's not the hu human way. It's not the natural way. It's the supernatural way. You're glad you came to church again this morning. Is that my phone ringing, by the way? No, it's not me. But I was ringing. I'm the preacher that his phone rings, you know what I mean? Instead of the people in the crowd. That's me. And so, so as I got into the book, I began to realize God starts off the book of Hebrews different than any other book. It starts off with the word, listen, God. <laughs> Most of the other books of the New Testament start off with like Paul, Peter, James. You know, I'm writing a letter to somebody because God's been doing something. You know, our mentality even about church is kind of, is kind of weird. You know, you know what church is? It's the result of God moving. We think we're supposed to go plant churches somewhere, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but really in the Bible what happened is they just went where God told them to go. They just, God said, go, separate Barnabas and Saul to the work that I have for them. And when they went, churches happened. Today what we do is we reverse engineer that. We're like, we're going to go make a church happen. And then we're like, but where's God? Hello. This is not to upset your apple cart. It's just to make you start to think. That's what we do. A lot of times we're doing it for God, and, and we're not realizing that we're blocking God. God's like, hey, listen, I raise up a people that cross over. How do they cross over? They don't really even know where they're going. I just call them to go and follow me. And as they're following, I teach them what to do. This is what Jesus did. He didn't start a Bible school. He said, you, follow me. You, follow me. You two guys over there in the boat, follow me. And the ones that followed him, wow, did they get a training. Better than any Bible school. Better than the one I went to. Bible school a lot of times just teach you to keep on doing what you've always been doing. But that'll work until the church carpet's being pulled out from under you. Everybody has so much at their fingertips today. I mean, look, we got more, me and Neil were talking, you got more here than, than the technology that got people to the moon. Right there. I have more Bible stuff here than I could possibly know what to do with. I love it, but there's a side to it that can be very, very deceptive. I can get so used to having it do it for me that I forget to do it. If I want to know a question about Hebrews, I can just find out what Gil thinks, what Barnes thinks, what Clark thought. Hello? What JFB, all those guys thought. All the commentaries you can think of, I find out what they thought, and then I can YouTube or I, or I can Google what anybody today thinks. And if I'm not careful, I can think just the doing of that is walking with God. But God's like, no, I want you to come walk with me, be an Abraham, be someone that crosses over. I'm going to walk you over all this here. I'm going to walk you through it. I'm going to cause you to be a rule breaker, somebody that goes and, and, and does things that, you know, you could never do on your own. Jesus said, without me, you could, with, without me, you could do nothing. But with them, we could do anything. So the book of Hebrews starts out like this. It talks about God. God's the better messenger. He said, man, God, God says, I sent a bunch of prophets. I sent angels. I sent messengers. But in these last days, I sent the best messenger of all. A messenger that's so much better than all the other messengers. That's the first chapter. Who's the messenger? His son. Well, the book is based on, just when you get through the first three verses, you realize this book is based on Psalm 110. Why don't you look there real quick? So when next time you read the book of Hebrews, you've got to think in terms of Psalm 110. And then you'll understand it a little bit better than maybe you did before. Psalm 110. Oh, I already tore the pages on my new Bible. It's terrible. I bought a Bible at Kurong. 
Do I have glasses? Yeah, I do. How many people have their Bible with them today? Psalm 110. Did you realize that Hebrews was based on Psalm 110? You know what I found as I was studying Hebrews? I didn't know this before. It's almost embarrassing, but I didn't realize this before. I've been preaching for years. I did not realize so much of the New Testament is direct quotes from the Old Testament. I knew there were some, but you start reading the book of Hebrews with a Bible that highlights those things. That's what happened to me. The Bible I was reading highlights the Old Testament, and I suddenly realized, wow, What's happening with the author of Hebrews is he's laying a firm foundation from the Old Testament so these listeners who are walking into a very critical time, remember we talked about just before the destruction of Jerusalem, they're walking into a very critical time, so 30 years after the cross, persecution's growing, they're being tempted to go back to find security, to go do something that seems like it's working because a lot of things around them are shaking. And so the writer just lays a firm foundation so they can keep right on moving forward. And remember I told you, most of the Christians in in Jerusalem, if not all of them, got out of Jerusalem. So they weren't there to suffer the horrific destruction that happened in that city because they were led by God. How were they led by God? Not just because we they say, we believe in being led by the Holy Spirit. No, because they really were practicing learning. Not that they were perfect, not that they were super religious, just that they were really had a heart for God and were really wanting to keep walking with God. That's what God's looking for today, right, Ian? <laughs> I love Ian, man. I look at Ian, he's doing the camera, and his face tells me the whole story. If I want to know him, is this sermon working out? I just look to Ian, right? And he's back there like this. I'm like, I at least got Ian. (laughs) So God starts off the book with God. (laughs) He's like, this is about me going forward, not even Paul, who is the New Testament pattern for every believer. That's what Paul said. I'm the pattern. God saved me and made me the pattern. God saved Paul and gave him the revelation of what in the world Jesus was talking about and then made his life a pattern for me and you to follow. Wow. What? Paul never said it's Jesus' gospel, Jesus' gospel, Jesus gospel. Paul's preaching, he says, my gospel. I was reading that one day, I'm like, what, what is up with Paul? And then I start to like, you know, study it and immerse myself and I realize, wow, I get Paul. I get what Paul's saying. Paul's not taking it away from Jesus. Paul immersed himself in Jesus until Jesus' message became his own message. See, the card is just to help, man. The card's just to help for me. That's all this thing is just to get the conversation with Jesus started. Not my message, His message. But you know what? I've been living this Christian life for a long time. It's become my message. I can talk to you about Jesus, what He did for me. I can talk to you about Jesus, what I've seen Him do for others. I can talk to you about Jesus, what it says in the Bible. I know Jesus. But sometimes you need a little starter. To just start that process because that's what God called us to do. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, but it's got to be like Paul. Paul's the pattern, but when it comes to the book of Hebrews, Paul might even have written this, but he doesn't use his name. He says God because God's greater than even Paul. Amen? A lot of times in our theology classes and Bible school and stuff, you know, we get so addicted to personalities and everything. That's what people do today. They follow personalities. Oh, oh, somebody built a big church. Well, ooh, that's easy to go attach myself to that because that makes me look good. Hello? But if God says just go out here and, you know, attach yourself to a small group of people, you know, it's not going to make you look good and everything, would you do it? Or are you still wanting to do what you want to do? Or have you gotten to the growth place yet where you realize, really, God gave me a free will, but... He's just waiting to see as a son, will he do really what I want him to do? And you say, well, God, you know, I fail so much. God's like, I'm not worried about that. It's not about you and your performance. It's about, do you want me? You see, we've been saying like the writer of the song, and I ain't missing you at all, but you're just lying to yourself. 
In fact, there's a verse in the song where he said, I can lie to myself. He admits I'm lying to myself. I really do miss my wife, man. I don't want to be over here and be unfaithful. I really be back in London with my wife. Forget the number one hit. But all the world today says, go make the number one hit. Go do it, man. Just do it. Do whatever you have to do. But it may cost you everything dear to you. And the church is finding out today, oh, you lost the ground you were standing on because you didn't realize that you weren't paying attention. Paying attention to what? To Jesus. You know, moonwalking through life like Michael Jackson, you know, thinking that we're doing something. Woo, wait, man, we're cool. Man, we got to lose all that stuff. Where's Michael Jackson today? Man, I loved Michael Jackson when I was a kid. I was like, wow, that's a great sound, you know, when I wasn't saved and everything yet. And then after I was saved, I was still like, wow, what a talent, right? Michael Jackson, but then if you kind of just look at the progression of his face, We're world class at just denying everything. You know, Michael, no, he's great. I'm a, look at the guy. The guy's becoming a demon in front of you. And the whole world's like, yay, Michael Jackson, you know? And then the Christians are right behind them. Yay, yay, yay. We can only get a Michael Jackson worship leader, right? We have the best church in town. And a lot of people will follow you, but it'll all be people that don't want to follow Jesus, really. Not really. But if you go through some things in life, you walk with him and he puts you through some tests and trials, you know what I mean? And he's not doing it to make you fall. He's doing it to grow you and to strengthen you and to prepare you because he's called you, you know? And if you go through it with him, all of a sudden after a while you find out, man, I don't want the easy stuff anyway. Look at me. I can do something now. Christians should be like, you know, Paul says in, in the fifth chapter, you guys should, remember this line? You guys should be teaching other people. He says, but you're not. And how come you're not? Because you haven't been trained. You're not sensitive to the things of the Spirit. You haven't been trained. Are we going too long? I'm going to wind it down. Kids are coming back. That's my signal. <laughs> how many people want to know what Paul said? You know, how, I'm trying to get to us today. Like, how do we get over this place that we're stuck in that we may not have realized that we're stuck in? How do we get past this? Paul's like, you should know by now how to do this stuff. And again, if it's like 30 years, and he's speaking to a bunch of people, 30 years from the cross-ish, 30-ish years from the cross, you know, really, there's nothing wrong with him saying that, is there? 30 years is, you know, is, is a good amount of time. I mean, you should learn something in 30 years. You shouldn't be at the height of whatever God's got you to be necessarily, but you should know if you think so. He's like, you guys should know by now, but the reality is you need somebody to teach you again. You know why? Because your ears are filled with all the wrong things. Because you can't hear. So I'm reading through the book of Hebrews, right? I'm immersing myself in it, Neil, and I'm driving to Missouri or whatever, and all of a sudden I, I realize, how long is the book of Hebrews? I look, oh, 13 chapters. I said to myself, how long could this book have been? See, things like that, just little God thoughts, you know, like, come on, come on. how long could Hebrews have been? How many stones could have been rolled away, Dave? You know what I mean? Because God is releasing a revelation, giving us something that we need to know to make it where we're going, but we limited it 13 chapters. How many times have we done that? We don't want somebody preaching truth to us, you know what I mean? We just want to hear something that we want to hear. But that's only going to keep you where you're at. You're not really thinking. You know today, one thing that's happening is I'm involved in cryptocurrencies a little bit with my son-in-law. He he's a financial guy. So when he got in, he was telling me, telling me about cryptos. I was so sick of this guy telling me about it. I'm like, what is a cryptocurrency? Cyber, cyber finance, right? Digital money. And so finally, one day I said, you know, I can either fight with my son-in-law and be mad because my daughter married him, or I can just try to create a bridge with him, you know, and I, I'm not a, much of a financial guy, business person, so I said, but I'll try to create a bridge and just, you know, try to figure out something. Well, I got immersed in that, and I started to figure out, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, I can see where this is going. This could be very important. Could be very important. And so then I listened to guys like Robert Kiyosaki, and he was saying, listen, you know, I'm a gold guy, I'm a real estate guy, but I have my... He said, I got my eight Bitcoins, he said, last year. 
And he said, I'm just sitting with them like eight little ducks and watching what they do. And, I, and when he said it, I said, well, that's what the Lord was doing with me. So I don't know anything really about any of this. I'm not a financial advisor. I just am glad that I spent the time with my son-in-law to get involved because if nothing else, I helped him. Because when I got involved and I looked at all the cryptocurrency world, you know what I saw on it? It's stamped with every pagan symbol known to man. Well, your money is too, at least American money is too. You know, we get the all-seeing eye and everything on the back of the $1 bill and all that. So it's nothing foreign, but we forget about that. And then people today just forget, they forget anything about symbolism. And then what's happening is we're all wearing stuff like this. Under Armour, you know. But what is Under Armour? Why does it have that attached to it? Well, if you do your research, you'll find out this little symbol right here is actually in the Bible. This is, this is what Jesus was talking about in John 21 when he, when he had them to catch the 153 big fish. Remember that? And this little symbol right here, that little area where the two, you know, like the master card and the, the fish is in the middle, you know, the little symbol in the middle is the two circles cross over. Remember that? That's called the sweet spot. That's the spiritual zone for those guys that are running the world. They're like, go in there, live in there, and you can pull out from there things that will make you rich and powerful here. Christians should already know all this stuff, but we don't know. So you're getting all these symbols at you all the time. And so I was like, well, why do they put the symbol on everything? Why does MasterCard have this symbol? Why does Underarm have this kind of symbol and all these other... In, in, in researching, I realized it's because like the hieroglyphics of old, it actually speaks to people's subconscious. You don't know what it's saying, but it's speaking to you. You hear today? And this is the real world you live in today. This is not by accident. You need to be somebody that realizes, oh yeah, I remember when Jesus talked about that. And in order to understand that, we can't talk about it today. You've got to go find out what does is, what is the 153 mean? You can't make the square area of this fish that Christians used to draw without the number 153. It's just one of those things that's in mathematics. And Jesus was calling us to, listen, if you walk with me, you will stay in the sweet spot. You will live in the sweet spot. And what kind of things will happen to you in the sweet spot? 153 fish right here. Big ones didn't even break the net this time. They remembered last time, Luke 5, they broke the net. Right? Everything was like, whoa, whoa, man, Jesus is so amazing. But, you know, they could not contain. But now they've been walking with him for all these years. And now he says, he appears to them, and he's like, hey, throw your net out on the other side. And they throw it over, and we remember what happens, right? They're like, wow, big, huge net. And, you know, they realize it's Jesus, and Peter jumps in and runs to Jesus, and they bring up the 153 fish. And Jesus is like, bring me those fish. And they, they dine together. They commune together. But the lesson is, hey, I'm the sweet spot. Jesus is saying, not me, Rocky, Jesus. I am the coming together of heaven and earth. This is just something Satan stole from God. But if we learn to follow Jesus today, I'm telling you, the world's way ahead of us. Just like Jesus said, the children of darkness are more advanced than these things. We've got some catching up to do, but we don't do it through intellect. We do it by learning to immerse ourselves in the things of the Spirit. And thus the song. You would not have been saying to yourself consciously that I'm missing, you know, that I'm missing God or I'm away from God. But maybe subconsciously, you know what I mean? In your heart. The book of Hebrews is about don't do what the children of Israel did. God came to them. God gave the same gospel to them. God gave the same. That's what he says. It's Jesus hadn't come to the cross yet, but the word's the same. It's still the same message. Remember the timeline? Still the same plan of God, same message. He brought it to them, but they didn't receive the blessing from it. Why? They didn't mix it with faith. They heard it, but the word being the heart-seeking missile, it came right up to their heart, but they didn't receive it. And in the not receiving it, they fell King James says their carcasses fell in the wilderness. You guys said they carked it in the wilderness, right? Carked it. <laughs> and what's the writer of Hebrews saying? Don't do this. God is telling you, this is what will happen to you, but it doesn't have to happen, and it's not my plan for you. I got something great for you. You're going to continue to go into all the world, and they did continue to go. 
They miss the devastation, man. I'm telling you today, there's potential danger all around us, no matter what country you live in, as the world's becoming a global space. It's all coming together, really kind of under the old banner of the Cold War. It's really kind of that same plan that the Chinese live under, you know what I mean? It's kind of not today, it's a communist capitalist thing, and that's where it's all going. But you and I need to understand, man, God's put us here for such a time as this. We are the difference makers. But don't sit back and go, well, I think everything will be all right. It might be, but what if it's not? We need to be right with God. We need to be walking with God. And we can just simply make that choice. It's just a choice. But because I, I travel in different churches, you know, I see the same kind of crowds of people. Even when I was in Ecuador this last year, I, I looked at the crowd and I was like, wow, these people have been too Americanized. They didn't used to look like this down here in South America. Now they're glazing over. It's like they want to, but what is it? It's the world has infringed upon them. They didn't realize they're being unfaithful. The heart's becoming cold, becoming hardened. Right? It's not that they're unreachable, but you're slipping, you're slipping, you're slipping. And God's like, listen, in the book of Hebrews, now stand up and make a choice to live by faith. Don't let the hardness of your heart stop you from responding to what God's saying today. And that's as simple as the sermon really is. What is God saying to us today? He's saying, will you respond to me? Raise your hand this morning if you're in this place. You say, oh, I really I just want to respond to God. We don't really all know what God's saying. God's doing a lot of different things today. Some will be things we're familiar with, and some will be things we're like, wow, I haven't heard that. And we'll have to have the responsibility to go check it out. But it'll be hard to do unless we're walking with God. Well, let's be the people that arise to the occasion. Yeah. When I first went to the nation of Chile, and I closed with this, I, uh, I lived in Denver where Neil and Nancy lived. And so the mountains in Denver, 14,000 feet something, you know, the 14ers they call them, 14,000 feet high. So when you, when you come into Denver from the plains, you drive in from the plains, and you start to see the mountains and they get bigger and bigger, and then they're just a certain size. When you're in Denver, you're looking up and the mountains are like, let's say about right here. You're like, wow, beautiful. Gorgeous mountains. Pikes Peak is there. Long's Peak is there. You know, I forgot what that, Mount Evans is there. Bobby's from there, so she loves all this stuff. And, and you're just like, that's great. So then... Because of working with Neil, I got sent down to, to Santiago, Chile. So when the plane landed, right, <laughs> and I got out and they drove me over to the coast, and that's the first time I really got a good look to look at the mountains, I looked where I was used to looking. And I was like, wow, the mountains are cool. Like, they, they're nice, but they're kind of like foggy right there. And it wasn't, it took me a second. I was looking and I'm thinking, you know, the mountains in Denver are better than these, Neil, but they say these Andes mountains are supposed to be so much better. And then suddenly it dawned on me, I went like this, I went, Oh, <laughs> and that's what we're, that's what, that's what we can do if we're not careful. We're used to right there, but what you need to do is just go like this. Oh, there he is. There he is. Great high priest after the order of Melchizedek, who has called me and you to walk in the perfect plan and the purpose of God. He's available to us every day. He's like, come to me, come boldly to the throne of grace. I'm here for you. I, you have, there's no, there's no way to fail. He's there for us every hour of every day. That's the story of the book of Hebrews. And it goes on to tell you, it won't always be easy. The world won't accept you. Religion won't accept you. But keep walking with Jesus. This is the way. So just before I came here, I uh, had to share my sheep. It's summertime in America. You can stand up with me if you will. All rise. <laughs> so I, I've got two sheep and four goats, right? And uh, so, so I am truly a shepherd. And for me, they're lawnmowers. I have three acres of land, and so they keep the they keep the area down, and so that's why I have them. And, but I kind of get I kind of got affectionate towards them over the years. And I've learned a few things. Now the goats will fight you always. If you try to go catch a goat, they'll fight you. You catch them by the horns, and they still fight with you. And sometimes you hold them, as yeah, this lady knows about goats, you hold them down and they're still fighting on the ground. You've subdued them and they're still fighting. But sheep are different. The sheep will run from you too. And my sheep are terrible at this. They'll run and run. And sometimes Bobby laughs at me. She'll see me out running around the pen. 
So I'll run and run. But you know what happens to a sheep as soon as you catch them? As soon as you grab them, they're easy to grab with that big wool. As soon as you grab them, they just surrender. It's just something how God created in their nature. They just, they just stop. They're going 100 miles an hour, and all of a sudden they just go. And so when you're shearing a sheep, you're thinking, the first time I did, I thought this is going to be a nightmare, you know? Like I'm going to get them in there. It's going to be a fight the whole time, and I got these scissors and everything. But I found out to my surprise pleasantly that as soon as I got them in the, into the confined little space, they just stood there like that. And this is what the Bible says about Jesus. He went to his shearers dumb like a sheep. He willingly just surrendered. He just went. And in doing that, what? He gave us the example to follow. He's like, just follow me. No matter what kind of situation you get into in life, just surrender to me. Don't even fight against the authorities. Don't try to be something out there. Don't try to change the world your way. Let me do it my way. Just surrender to me. And that's really what God's saying is to us today. Just let me clip the wool. Father, we just thank you this morning. God, for whatever you're doing and saying. And Lord, our ears are open to the voice of the Holy Spirit in this hour. We're asking you, Lord, roll away the stones. We, we may not even know and understand where stones are at in our lives, Lord, or what kind of things, God, that we've really been, you know, under or oppressed by. But in the name of Jesus this morning, by the Spirit of life, I command stones to be rolled away. Let the light come in to the empty spaces of the dark spaces. Let the life come into the dead spaces. In the name of Jesus. Now. right now in your life let the light of God begin to come in where you've maybe you just realized today man I have become a little hardened just on the edge of my heart over here in this area over here in this other area maybe I haven't been I really haven't been as awake as I thought I was that's just the Holy Spirit dealing and working and saying okay I'm going to do something now Lord we ask you to do it in Jesus name hallelujah come in Father God we won't let you pass by us we won't let you go by, Lord, without a ruckus, without a, without a call, without a request. Lord, we choose you. Lord, I ask you to raise up in this house today, Father, those that are called now to, to, to take the next step in their life. Not, not talking about in or out of the church. I'm talking about the next step into what God has called you to do. But that become clear and available to people, Lord God. To break the power of the, of, the, uh, of the wrong spirits over people's lives. That try to keep them out of that. In Jesus' name. Father, make this a crossing over people. We give you the praise and the honor. Hallelujah. If you need prayer for anything this morning, you say, Pastor Rock, I feel like I've been in an area where I've been stuck or anything like that. I felt stuck or I felt challenged or I felt like I wanted to go forward but I couldn't go forward. That's the call I want to give. And so as I turn it over to Neil, come and uh, if you need prayer, I'll pray for you. Thank you, Pastor Neil. Amen. How about we sing that forever song? Is that okay? Is that what you're ready for? <laughs> Amen. Just come right now. It's God's talking to you. and just want to come out of that. The stone's rolled away. Amen. Stones rolled away, friends. Stones rolled away. Okay. The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, His blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon Him. Oh Jesus, we worship you Lord, we worship you Jesus. One final breath he gave 
as heaven looked away, Holy God. the Son of God was laid in darkness. The battle in the grave, the war on death was waged, the power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake, the storm 